Hello. Today is January 11th, 2011. We're meeting today with Mr. Clarence Athene at his home in Loveland, Colorado. My name is Brad Hoops. I'm the interviewer for the Northern Colorado Veterans History Project. Welcome, Mac, and thanks for sitting down to tell your story today. Let's start out, if we could. Tell us a little bit about yourself, uh, your date of birth, where you're born, a little bit about your family. Okay, I was born February 8, 1919, 5 a.m. in uh, Westboro, well, on a farm, three miles west and one mile north of Westboro, Missouri, in Atchison County, Missouri. And uh, I spent the first 21 years of my life on the farm. And uh, when things broke out in Europe, I think it was about 1940, I and one of my friends tried to enlist in the Marines. Well, he made it, but I couldn't make it. Why was that? I'm colorblind. So, uh, I wanted to fly, and as a consequence of that desire, I tried to enlist in the Air Force, and they wouldn't have me. I tried to enlist in the Navy, and they wouldn't have me. So I said, well, to heck with it. So I went to school in Kansas City, Missouri, to a place called the uh, American Aeronautical Institute. <laughs> Real high-powered sounding place, but what they did was just taught us how to drive aircraft rivets and cut aluminum to fit, you know. I spent three months in school there, and then uh, I and another guy, uh, saddled up in his 1929 Plymouth, and we went to Baltimore, Maryland. And I worked for Glen L. Morton Aircraft for 50 cents an hour. Now, prior to that, uh, I imagine growing up the farm, you probably hadn't traveled too far away uh, growing up. So this must have been a major, major oh, trip for you. Right. Yeah. Well, I the farthest I'd been from home was uh, in Bolivar, Missouri, which was about 300 miles south of where I grew up. That's, my folks were from Bolivar area. But anyway, uh, I went back there to Baltimore and worked at Glen Ellen Martins. And that was in the fall of 1940. And I can't remember how long I was there, but anyway, I quit there and went back out to Wichita, Kansas to Boeing Aircraft I hired on there. And uh, December 7th, I was in the hospital. I never will forget that. My mother was just devastated. There I was in the hospital, you know, and she came up told me that she had heard that the Japanese had invaded uh, Hawaii, you know, and she just cried. Well, uh, it didn't affect me like that. It, it, it sounded kind of exciting, actually, because I figured, well, shucks, I'm going to go into the service whether I want to or not. But anyway, while I was working at Boeing Aircraft, they kept getting deferments for me. Because mm -hmm. it was a... And they got me three deferments, the six-month deferment. And it just turned out that a lot of the guys that I buddied with got drafted or enlisted. And most of the per guys that I liked to buddy around with were gone. And I got to where I couldn't hardly stand to go to work because I couldn't tolerate those the attitude of those guys out there, you know. So I wrote to the draft board and told them I was ready to be drafted. They sent me a letter back and said, we can't take you, we're full up. <laughs> I thought, boy, 
what kind of a critter am I? I can't even get drafted. <laughs> and so anyway, I just went back to work. And in a two or three months, I, I got another draft notice. And the supervisor, he heard about it. And uh, he came and says, okay, give me that. We'll get you another day for him. And I said, no way. I said, I am leaving this place. So I kept my uh, draft notice, and sure enough, they called me. And I was in March of 1943, the first part of March, where I was drafted. And I was drafted in uh, Fort Leonard Wood, Kansas. And uh, well, we spent a week or so there, and they uh, boxed us all up. And what what branch did you get drafted into? What branch of the service did you get drafted? Well, just the army. Just the okay. Yeah. And anyway, after spending a week or two at uh, Fort Leonard Wood, where they uh, stuck us on a train and shipped us to Miami, Florida. For basic training. <laughs> we had those high powered hot, uh, hotels for barracks. <laughs> we were right on the beach at Miami. <laughs> Wonderful place to <laughs> Sounds like more of a vacation than basic. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, when I got through with basic training, They advanced me to corporal, and I thought, hey, how about this? And they sacked a bunch of us up and shipped us up to uh, Camp Crowder, Missouri. And we went to, well, I went to what they call wire school. Learned uh, telephone and radio circuits and how to install them and how to wire them, you know. Now, was this camp very close to home? How far away from home were you at this point? Did... Well, Camp Crowder was in southern Missouri. Oh, okay. It's about 300 miles. Oh, okay, okay. But anyway, uh, I can't remember for sure how many months I was in Camp Crowder, but anyway, we finished that instruction tour there, and lo and behold, if they didn't load a bunch of us on a train, and shipped us to Drewfield, Florida. <laughs> I thought, boy, how lucky can you get? Because I was always kind of skeptical about being shipped to New York or uh, Alaska. Yeah, yeah. And uh, we went back to uh, Florida, Drewfield, and uh, I was transferred into a aircraft warning unit is a radar outfit. Radar was brand new then, you know. And we trained there uh, you know, for a year and a half or so. I can't remember for sure. But anyway, when we finished the training there, it was in November of 1944. They loaded us on a train in Miami, hauled us clear to San Pedro, California. <laughs> Put us on a ship, finally, and uh, we went to Australia, and we docked at Melbourne. Well, let me ask you, Mac, uh, here's this farm boy from Missouri getting on a ship. How was that for you? Did you get your sea legs or did you, how did you get seasick or how was the crossing no, to Australia? I enjoyed every minute of it. Never did get seasick. As a matter of fact, I was in hog heaven because they had all that chow and there. A lot of guys did get seasick <laughs> and the Navy puts out good food, I'll tell you. No, I enjoyed every minute of it. I, I can't believe it. It was, and you know, it was kind of tragic in some respects because during basic training down in Miami, we, uh, where they put bunk beds all over that place, the lobby was, at the hotel we was in was full of 
cots, you know. I'd hear guys crying in the middle of the night. I had mixed feelings. I was disgusted, but I felt sorry for him at the same time, you know, because I was having a ball. <laughs> and anyway, we got on the ship and they shipped us to, uh, we stopped in Australia at Melbourne. We were there for three days. How long did it take you roughly to get to Australia? Do you remember? Two weeks. Two weeks? Okay. And the comical thing happened while we were there in Melbourne, that dock, they wouldn't let us off the ship. They would let us down on the dock just a little bit. And one day they let us off the ship and they were trucks running in and out, you know, to resupply the ship. And we were all standing around there just like guys will do, you know, shooting the bull, you know. And one old boy took off running and he jumped in the back of a truck and right out the gate he went. <laughs> he disappeared in that truck. The MPs never did see him or nothing. And everybody just shouted and hooted for him, you know. And I, we never did hear what happened to him, but anyway, he disappeared. <laughs> but anyway, after zero or four days there in Melbourne, why we loaded back on that ship. Melbourne is on the south side of Australia, you know. And uh, we loaded up, went back out. 50 or 60 miles from the coast and headed west again and we ran into the doggone storm I ever saw and we was on a great big troop ship there was 5500 of us on that troop ship and we had a what they called a corvette for a escort just one corvette because we were far enough south they didn't worry about the Japanese submarines, you know but anyway, we went across the Indian Ocean and... Did you have any idea where you were going? Did they tell no, you? we were going to India. Oh, uh, okay. We were going to India, we knew that. But anyway, we uh, went up the west side of India and we uh, disembarked at Bombay. We, well, as a matter of fact, we ate Thanksgiving dinner on the ship at Bombay of 1944. Mm. And like I say, the Army put, or the Navy puts out good food and they gave us the most fantastic Thanksgiving dinner you ever wanted to see, you know, before we got off that ship. And we were all thankful for that because they loaded us on one of those limey trains to go back over to the east side of India, if you can imagine mm -hmm. that. We went back to uh, the province of Assam. And that's well, on the very, very east side of India, you know, in the very northeast corner. And uh, we went to a place called Dinjan, and they had an air base there, and they finally loaded us on airplanes and hauled us down to a town in central Burma. This town was called Bamo, and we were in Bamo for several months, and we got the Japs pushed south and they shipped us back up to India for a, well, we were there for about a, two or three weeks. And they loaded us on airplanes and hauled us back into Burma. And we went to a place called, uh, no, wait a minute. The first place we went in Burma was called Michinal. That's in more or less northern central part of uh, Burma. And uh, after our, stay in uh, 
India after we was in Michigan and they loaded us up and took us back into Burma to Bamo. And uh, we landed in Bamo just, they just got the Japs pushed out of there. Bamo looked like a turnip field. There was mortar shells sticking out of the ground everywhere. When they had the Battle of Bamo, it was during the monsoon season. The ground was so soft that those mortar shells didn't go off. Mm. And of course, we got a big lecture on don't touch the shells. And the engineers came over there and started blowing those things up, you know. And uh, we set up our radar system and we had outposts 50 or 60 miles out from our headquarters, you know, the radar stations and that they would radio back into. We, we were what they called the control center. Okay. And they had a big plotting board in there, you know, where uh, these radar outfits would call in these, uh, well, it was a path of an airplane is what it was, you know. Mm -hmm. And they would plot this course on this big plotting board, which was nothing but a great big map on a table, you know. Now, what was your job? Was your job to operate the radar or to repair no, the radar? Or? Well, I did mostly telephone and radio uh, switchboard repair. Okay. And the strange thing there, though, that the Air Force and the Navy and everybody else wouldn't have me because I was colorblind. They put me in the Signal Corps working on switchboards, and those switchboards were full of colored wires. <laughs> How did you work around that? How did you manage to do that? Uh, I carried a no-meter all the time. <laughs> Check the circuits out. I told him, I said, how ridiculous can you get? If you let me have an airplane, I'm liable to kill myself. But you put me out here, and if I make a mistake, I could wipe a whole battalion out. <laughs> <laughs> but that was that old thing in the uh, joke in the Army, you know, if they send you to cook in Baker School, they'll make a truck driver out of you. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, we were in uh, Bamo for oh, four or five months, and we got kept getting the Japs pushed further south, you know. And uh, they finally loaded us back up and took us back to India, and we was in India for a couple of weeks. And they turned around and shipped us, put us on airplanes. And we went back into Burma, in northern Burma, in an area called the Naga Hills. The Naga Hills is the home of the Naga tribesmen. The Naga, tri Naga tribesmen were headhunters. I had pictures. You still have pictures. That, well, the deal was most of the heads that they took were children. The big deal was, if they got a child's head, that showed that they got through all the enemy, and because when right, they would sure. fight each yeah. other, well, they would take the women and the children and the old people and try to hide them, you know. And if you could come back from a battle with a child's head, that meant you had got through all of the enemy, you know. And they would put these kids' heads on posts, and they would throw spears at them. Those pictures showed those little faces all full of bruises and cuts where they had thrown these darts and these spears at them, you know. And that, you talk about a shock for us old Midwestern. Well, that's, that's one question I want to ask you about. Uh, backing all the way up, once again, I, you know, I keep going back to this Midwest um, Missouri farm boy. What was it like? What were you seeing as you were going, taking a train across India and into Burma? It must have been an incredible experience. It was incredible. 
well, by the time I went in their service, my most farmers had tractors. Over there in India, they were still farming with oxen, with wooden plows. And we just marveled at that. That trip across India was really interesting. The uh, well, the limey trains are different than ours, you know. They're different gauge, and they got a shriek and whistle. <laughs> they were a mess. <laughs> but anyway, they they were pretty efficient, but they didn't have any bridges. Every time we'd come to the river, we had to unload and ferry across the river and load up on the other side and get on another train and take off, you know. And yeah, we were just shocked that things were so backward there, yeah, you know. Yeah. And we don't know what poverty is. To those Indians, we were all big baboos, as they called them. We talked with them a lot, you know, if we could find someone that could speak English. And they couldn't believe, well, I was a sergeant. And I got $78 a month. $78 a month was an unheard of salary in India. Well, a, a rupee was worth about 33 cents about three rupees to a dollar, you know. And if you had a job for 150 rupees, you were one of the upper crust. The people who had jobs that paid that kind of money were the policemen and the railroad conductors and people like that, you know. The average coolie made about anywhere from 8 to 16 cents a day. We couldn't believe that. And if you, well, when they found out that most of us GIs had automobiles, we were, well, they, they had all the terms for people. That we were big baboos. <laughs> a baboo was a, was a rich man, and if you were a big baboo, you were a real rich man. In India, if you owned a, owned a bicycle, you were rich, you know. And when they found out that most of us GIs had automobiles, they just couldn't get over it, you know. And I felt so sorry for those people. They were starving to death. Mm. And they just loved to work for the U.S. Army because we fed them better than they'd ever been fed in their lives, you know. Well, they ate primarily rice, you know. And, well, as an example, well, I'm getting ahead of myself here. Let's go back. Okay. We went to this place in northern Burma where these headhunters were. Mm -hmm. It's called Xingbuang. And what we were doing there, we were loading airplanes with army supplies and uh, barley. They had mule trains that they used for carrying supplies down in south of uh, Bamo and over towards China. And this barley was for the mules to eat, you know. And we loaded airplanes with all of those supplies there to this strip in Xingyuang and uh, after that tour and we went back up into India why uh, we kept loading airplanes to going to Kunming China it was supplying general what did you say China Chiang Kai-shek mm -hmm. we were shipping supplies to him and, of course, the Flying Tigers were over there, too, you know. Uh, General Chenault, boy, he was a salty old boy. 
Well, we had two or three salty old generals over there. General <laughs> Stillwell, mm -hmm. Joe Stillwell, and uh, what did they call him? Vinegar Joe. Vinegar Joe Stillwell. And we were mixed up most of all the time we were over there with Merrill's Marauders. And there was another salty old boy. Is that General Merrill? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and one of my main deals to try to make it through the thing, I watched those Merrill's Marauders because that was the best bunch of soldiers I ever saw in my life, you know. And I figured, well, they've, they've got the experience and they've got the training. I'll just imitate them. It must have worked because here I am. <laughs> <laughs> but it was really interesting. Well, as a matter of fact, I'm going to jump ahead a little bit here. When we came home, there was a bunch of Merrill's Marauders on our ship coming home. And most of those old boys had jungle rot in their feet and they could hardly walk. It was, that was just part of what they went through, you know. How about, how was it for you as far as being in those conditions? Did you ever succumb to any uh, jungle diseases or like malaria or anything like that? Or how did you make out as far as yourself? I got jungle rot one time. Now, that's what we call it. Which to, to those that will watch us is a, is a skin disease, right? Is there, can you describe jungle rot and what it is? For those that will watch us tape, what jungle rot is? Well, they didn't know what it was. They tried everything in the world to try to cure it. And it was something that we never did know whether the, the, the medication helped it or whether it just ran its course. Because, uh, well, I had a place here on my neck. I didn't think it was ever gonna heal up, you know. And it finally did, and like I say, I don't know whether it just ran its course or whether the medication had anything to do with it or not, you know. And infections over there were just horrendous, you know. And of course, malaria. And they gave us Adabrine. And boy, I took that Adabrine faithfully. We all turned yellow. They all said we all looked like a bunch of Japs, you know. That those Adabrine pills were yellow. And they gave us one every day. And as a consequence, why we got a yellow chin tinge to our skin, you know. And when we came back to the States, everybody could tell where we had been because we were yellow. Wow. Uh, uh. But anyway, we had gone back up into India and we were still loading planes for Kunming, China. And this was getting Oh, along in the summer of 45, and the war was winding down pretty well, you know. We had the Japs on the run, and I felt kind of sorry for those suckers, as a matter of fact. They were starving to death. We hardly ever captured any of them, but when we did, they were just skin and bones. They didn't have anything to eat. Their supply lines were all cut, you know, and uh, all they had was what they could carry and their uniforms were all in tatters, you know. Well, they just rotted off of them. And uh, yeah, I, I did, I felt sorry for them. Hmm. Well, we saw jillions of dead ones, you know, and they were all just skinny as rails. As well as a matter of fact, all the time I was in Burma, I only saw one Jap prisoner. We didn't take prisoners. I suppose that would be a no-no nowadays, but... Well, and they often fought to the bitter end. They wouldn't surrender oftentimes, too. It was part of it, I, I must say. Well, that was part of yeah, it, yeah. yeah. But they would surrender. But, well, the fact that they were, so many of them were reluctant to surrender and 
the attitude of the average GI was not very benevolent, you know. <laughs> yeah. So, is well, latter part of '45 when the Japanese surrendered. Well, they shipped us uh, to a holding camp north of Calcutta. And we spent about three weeks there waiting for a ship. And we loaded on the ship the first part of December of 1945. Oh, wow. And we left, well this was in Calcutta. We left Calcutta and went down around the end of India, across the Indian Ocean, Bay of Bengal, and went over and went through the Suez Canal, across the Mediterranean, across the Atlantic, landed in New York City. So you went completely around the world. Exactly. But uh, the feelings that you have in a lot of those situations is hard to describe. One of the greatest feelings I think any of us had was when we pulled into New York Harbor and saw that Statue of Liberty. That was the greatest sight. Wow. What that represents. Mm. Well, there's just nothing like it. That's yeah, all there is I to it. I can't imagine. Wow. It's, it's just a, a big symbol of what the United States is. And there we had spent all that time over there to protect that thing. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And uh, by and large, most of us were just tickled to death to do it and we'd do it again. Huh. But uh, when we pulled in New York Harbor, Harbor, three ships met us, and they were spraying water jets, you know, and every one of the ships were, had a band on it and a whole bunch of celebrities, movie stars, and whatever, you know. And uh, we steamed up New York Harbor right close to the Statue of Liberty and as we went past the <clears throat> didn't realize I still had some of these feelings. Oh, well, fair enough. As we steamed past the Statue of Liberty, the bands on our ship and on those three ships that met us all broke out with God Bless America. Mm. And we all threw our hats in the ocean and screamed and hollered, you can't believe it, you know. And uh, we finally docked there in New York and they loaded us on a train and they took us to Camp Kilmer, New Jersey. And the big deal was a steak dinner when you got off of that ship, you know. And you should have seen this. <laughs> they had a steak as big as a plate and about three quarters of an inch thick, you know. And all of the trimmings. And we were in Camp Kilmer Oh, I don't remember how long, but they finally loaded us up 
and shipped us off to the various demarcation or dismissal points, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. And they shipped uh, me and a bunch of other guys to Camp Chafee, Arkansas. And we were discharged at Camp Chafee. <clears throat> and uh, well, this is the part my wife didn't especially like to hear. Uh, I had got married just before I left the states. No. Oh. And the gal I married lived in Dodge City, Kansas, so that's where I headed from Camp mm -hmm. Kilmer and mm -hmm. went to uh, Dodge City, Kansas. And I could tell by the letters I was getting that things were pretty cool. I hadn't seen her for darn near two years, you know. Yeah. <laughs> we had bought a 19... 41 Ford convertible while I was overseas and she drove up in that car and I'd run out to meet her, you yeah. know, and she says, get your bag, get your bag. So I'd turn around and grab my duffel bag and threw it in the back seat and jumped in the passenger side of the car and I just sat there looking at it. She's sitting there with her hands on the steering wheel. She didn't even look at me. She says, I don't want to be married. I said, fine. I jumped out of that car and started dragging my duffel bag out of the car, you know. She said, where are you going? I said, I didn't come home to fight you. The war's over. Um, if you don't want to be married, that's fine. Well, she started crying then. And that was a, uh, well, maybe I'm hard-hearted, but it didn't make me feel sad. It didn't even make me angry. I just said, that's it, period. And I got her divorce. Well, she had the guts to introduce me to her boyfriend. <laughs> <laughs> but I should do more power to you. <laughs> so anyway, that was in 1946. And uh, that pretty well covers it. Uh, Army experience. You know. Well, I'd like to go back and ask you some questions, if it's okay. Uh, talk about what was uh, your living conditions like in India and Burma, as far as your housing and the food, and uh, how was that for you? Uh, did had you get plenty, plenty of food? But it was mostly C rations and K rations, you know. Plenty of food, though. Living conditions. We hardly ever had a house. We was always in tents. Yes. How did that work out as far as uh, like the monsoon season and the, and the heat? I mean, how did you deal with that kind of, those conditions? Was it? Well, it wasn't very comfortable, but we made it. Yeah. It wasn't, wasn't, yeah. It wasn't something you couldn't tolerate if you set your mind to it. I mean, what are you gonna do? Yeah. It's like falling off a building. <laughs> Not much you can do about it until it comes to an end, you know. Yeah. And uh, the Indian people, well, actually, I think most of the GIs, I was kind of proud of the GIs, the way they treated the Indian people. They were so generous. The Indian population just loved the GIs, you know. And they soon found out that a GI was a sucker for a little kid, you know. And they would bring their little kids, just toddlers, a boxy sob, boxy sob, which meant gave me something, you know. 
They taught them to beg. Hmm. Well, shucks, a little kid come up to four or five GIs and that little rascal would leave there loaded down with candy bars and cigarettes and whatever else that they could get him to take, you know. They wouldn't take anything, well, like pork and beans. We tried to, we had tons of sea rations. And sea rations were in tin cans. And there were beans and hash and stuff like that. And uh, they wouldn't touch that because it had meat in it. Mm. They would take, well, they loved candy bars, and of course there's no meat in that, and they would take the candy bars, you know. And, uh, I don't ever remember getting any of them to take any K rations either because they couldn't tell what was in the K rations, you know. The K rations were combat rations, you mm -hmm. know. Mm -hmm. Just just a little box about about that thick and about that wide and about that long, you know. You could stick a half a dozen of them in your pockets, you know. And uh they weren't the most tasty things in the world, but they were sure nutritious, you know. And, well, if that's all you had to eat, they weren't bad. Yeah. Well, you, you talked about that nice steak dinner you had in New Jersey. While you were over in India and Burma, did you ever have cravings for something? Uh, oh, yeah. 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 We, uh, well, it was kind of interesting. Most of the guys missed milk. Mm -hmm. Ah, I wish I had a glass of milk. I hear that so often. Yeah. And uh, of course, we wouldn't take any of the native milk because there's no telling what in the Sam Hill you're getting there, <laughs> you know. And uh, most of our meat came out of Australia. Mutton, <laughs> a little bit of beef, and if you want something that'll kill your appetite, you get some of that Australian mutton. <laughs> when you cook that stuff, you couldn't really stand to be in this kitchen, <laughs> and they ship tons of that stuff to us, you know. How was, uh, what would you do when you weren't on, on duty? What would you do on your time off for entertainment to, to, to kill the time? Slip. Slip? That's G.I.'s favorite pastime is sleep. Because you, if you don't sleep when you got a chance, uh, you're liable to get yourself in a real bind, you know. Yeah, I, most of the time we just slept, you know. And, uh, well, the other thing was scrounging food. We would start prowling around the neighborhoods that we had moved into to see if there was any vegetables growing, you know. And those Burmese were great gardeners, boy, I'm telling you. Well, when they started coming back down out of the hills, you know, they disappeared from those villages, went up into the mountains. And when they came back, I was surprised. They must have had a bunch of seeds with them because they started planting gardens right away. And in just a matter of weeks, they had vegetables that they were peddling to us, you know. They were industrious people, I'll tell you. Hmm. Well, you, they had to be to survive in that environment over there, you know, because, uh, well, it's something that I found real interesting. They weren't very big people. When we were loading those airplanes, I had 23 of those, we called them gooks. I had 23 of them, and 
had one guy, well, there's two or three of them could speak a little English, but had this one guy that was, he could speak real good English, you know, and he was our interpreter. And I talked with him a lot. And one day we got to talking about the size of these guys that we had loading these airplanes. And we ran them across the scales. The biggest one weighed 148 pounds. The rest of them was around 130. But you talk about strong. That one that weighed 148 pounds, I, I told this uh, interpreter, I said, boy, he looks like a giant compared to most of you. I said, and we were had this uh, barley in 80-pound sacks, and they carried everything on their heads, you know, and they'd stick one of those on their head and go bouncing over to throw it in the airplane. And I asked this interpreter, I said, how many sacks of that grain do you think that guy can hold? He kind of giggled and said, I don't know, never thought about it. And so he asked this guy, and they jibber-jabbered there for a while, you know. And uh, we soon drew a crowd, you know, there's the guys heard them talking, you know. And uh, so they decided, well, we'll just see. So they stood that guy out there, and uh, a bunch of them got around him, and two of them would pick a sack of that grain up and stack on his head. And they stacked uh, any, they stacked six sacks of grain on that guy's head. Uh, I just about fell over, you know. When they got that sick sack up there with this guy that they was loading up, you know, well, he said something, you know, and everybody jumped back. Well, he just made a quick movement, just went down and to the side, and that green just all fell straight down, you know. But I couldn't believe that little sticker could hold <laughs> that much weight at home. Wow. Uh, well, everything they did, they did by hand, you know, They'd go out and they'd cut rice and they'd carry it in where they'd, they had shoulder poles, you know, and they'd put a big gob of rice on each end of this pole, you know, and then they'd get under that thing right in the middle and get it balanced, and then they would, they would get that thing to bouncing up and down, you know, and then when they got it, this, this bouncing sequence they wanted, where they'd take off and they well, they, they had to time it just right, you know, so that the, the, the weight was going up when they were putting the foot on the ground, you know. Huh. There wow. was a real technique to carrying a weight without it tearing your head off, you know. And we found that real interesting, that how sure. they would get that big load of rice and get that shoulder pole centered up, balanced just right, and then they would just stand there and they'd start jumping up and down and get that thing to flexing, you know, and when it got to just where they want it, the way they could just step out and it looked like it didn't weigh nothing. I'll you know? be done. Huh. It was interesting. Huh. Hmm. Really interesting. How was it being uh, in those isolated bases like that as far as communications from home, letters from home and such? Were you getting mail or no? We got mail, but very seldom and a lot of times. We'd, we'd go two or three months without getting anything, you know. Was, well, uh, actually, we had other things that were more important than mail that we needed, you know. And um, they, they tried to about uh, at least every three months send a mail plane in. But, yeah, we'd rather have bullets than we'd letters, you know. Yeah. And the way things were over there, there's no roads, you know. I mean, you talk about primitive, my goodness gracious. Well, you know, they built that, 
what do they call it, Toledo Road? Have you heard of that, Toledo Road? Mm. The Burma Road? Oh, the Burma Road, uh-huh. Well, the Lido Road started up in Lido, India. And it ran down through Burma to Lashio. And it connected with the Burma Road, and it went east then over into Kunming, China, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, that Lido Road, you can't believe the traffic on that Lido Road. They just went in there with bulldozers and just bo dozed a trail through that jungle. And, well, I still don't know how we ever did that because during the monsoon season, that mud would get knee deep, you know. But they plowed up and down that crazy road with those trucks. I don't know how in the world they ever did that. Uh -huh. It was incredible. And, if you wanted to get something to China, don't give it to a Chinese. Those Chinese tore up more equipment than we could haul over there. <laughs> I couldn't believe that. They'd take off the brand new truck and that thing, if they got to, to Lashio with it, it was a miracle. Well, they even tore tanks up getting up those mountains for crying out loud. One time, I can't remember exactly what the situation was, but there was a Chinese outfit, and they were moving forward, and there was about seven or eight tanks. Now, I don't know where they didn't know how to drive them or what, but they was going up this pretty steep mountain, and uh, we all thought they'd just put it in low gear and just creep up that mountain, you know. Well, they would sit in that tank, this driver would, and he'd rev that engine up until it sounded like it was going to fly to pieces, and he'd let the clutch out, and that old tank would rear up and almost fall over backwards, and it would squirt forward about 20 or 30 feet, you know. And they'd do that all the way up that doggone mountain, you know. Well, a lot of those tanks, by the time they got to the top of that mountain, they was a wreck, you know. Hmm. Yeah, you could go up and down that Lido Road and you could find all the tanks and trucks you wanted if you wanted wrecks, you know. But uh, the other thing that really surprised us was the uh, Chinese soldiers' attitude towards their buddies. I told you about these mortar shells. Mm -hmm. And one time there was a Chinese platoon. I guess it was on some sort of a little training exercise because there was an officer with them and they were looking at mortar shells and jibber jabbering, you know. <clears throat> and one of these Chinese went and screwed the doggone nose cone off of one of these shells where the doggone thing exploded. And they near blew one old boy's foot off and knocked about ten of them down. I don't know how bad it hurt them, you know. And the ones that didn't get hurt, they all jumped back and run out of, away from it about twenty feet, you know, and they turned around and looked, and they started laughing and pointing at these guys that were scattered around that that motor shell had blowed down, you know. We felt like shooting the suckers ourselves. Hmm. Well, we almost had a war with them there. One time, I can't remember where that was. It was just in northern Burma somewhere, but they put the word out that they going to have a movie. Well, gee whiz, that was a big treat, you know, so we all saddled up to go to the movie. And when we came back to our bivouac area, those doggone Chinese had cleaned us out. They'd stole our rifles and our clothes and anything that wasn't tied down, they took it. Well, everybody started getting their guns and they was going to go down the road and clean that Chinese <laughs> outfit out. Well, we run into a, an MP company. <laughs> they stopped us. <laughs> 
Uh, wow. Well, let's talk. Uh, I've got a couple questions here I'd like to ask you. Um, what were what was it physically like where you were at in Burma? I, I assume you were in the jungle then, or what was the base camp? What was your camp like? Well, a lot of vegetation. India itself was well, rice paddies, rice paddies, yeah, rice yeah. paddies, you know. But there were areas of jungle, but Burma was, well, it seemed like Burma was all jungle. There was a rice paddies, but nothing like it was in India, you know. The rice paddies were smaller, and not so many of them. And up in India, the rice paddies were huge. Most, most of them were run by the English, you know. And uh, it, it was, well, there were areas where it was thickly wooded, but there were areas where it was real open, you know. There's acres and acres and acres of rice paddies, you know. In 1943, the monsoon season didn't develop like it normally does. And those poor Indians died by the thousands. Mm. They didn't raise the rice crop. It was surprising. Uh, us old GIs couldn't imagine rice being such a big thing, you know. But that's all they ate. Well, they ate a lot of peppers, and their, their food was pretty spicy, you yeah. know. But rice was the staple. If they had rice, ah, boy, everything was fine, you know. Huh. And uh, it was incredible. They had cows and goats running all over India, and we couldn't believe that they wouldn't eat those doggone cows, you know. <laughs> oh, they might eat one of their ancestors, you know. Yeah. Yeah. And they would lay down and die before they would eat any of that stuff, you know. Huh. Well, it's something else that we found kind of strange. I had a driver's license, and uh, one of the things that I'd get instructed every time I went to check out a vehicle, don't kill a cow. Yeah. It's all right to run over an Indian, but don't run over a cow. <laughs> Can you tell the story about the time you were uh, alone in the jungle? Can you tell the story about the time you were alone in the jungle? Oh, yeah, we were down, we would, had just moved into Bama, and we still hadn't quite scoped out the lay of the land very good, and we didn't know for sure exactly where the Japs were, you know. And I got separated from the outfit. I can't remember now how it happened. Hmm. But I found my way back to where we were bivouacked. And we had bivouacked right by a great big area that was, we called it elephant grass. This stuff looked like grass, but it was about 10 or 12 feet tall, you know. And I mean, it was thick. You couldn't, you could get through it, but you had to crawl through it, you know. And uh, it was at night. Hmm. And I heard all this rustling out in that grass, you know. And I could vision the Japanese sneaking up on me, you know. And I finally found a place that was just darker than the inside of a coal mine. And I thought, well, even if I can't see, maybe they can't see me either. But I sat down on the ground and can't remember for sure how I was sitting there, but I had my carbine across my knees and I stuck a trench knife in the ground right beside my leg over here. And I figured I'd use up all my ammunition and I'd grab that knife, you know. 
and I kept hearing these rustling noises out in that grass, you know, and I was afraid to breathe. And that went on for about three hours, and I'm telling you, I was almost a nervous wreck, and some of the guys finally showed up, you know. I didn't tell them what had been going on because, uh, well, you know, I thought maybe they'd laugh at me. But I had one buddy, I told him about it. And the next morning, we went out in that elephant grass to see if we could see any signs of the Japs being there. It was jackals crawling around in that doggone grass, you know, making that noise. And boy, I felt like shooting every jackal I could get my sights on. <laughs> uh, you know, you are so scared. Oh, sure. I, I knew those guys could hear my heart beating. Wow. It felt like my heart was going to pound my ears out, you know. Oh, boy. And I, well, you breathe real shallow, taking a deep breath. You're afraid to hear you. And that kind of fear would just almost incapacitate you, you know. But when it's all over with, that did something to me. I didn't panic, and I was, well, I was thankful for that, you know. Every GI, well, I'll say 99% of them, that's what you worry about, how you're going to react under situations like that and under fire. They all worry, are you, am I going to chicken out? And you go through stuff like that, and it does something to you. Mm. Because after going through that and a lot of other stuff, you know, I haven't been afraid of anything. Is that right? Yeah. Huh. Well, you, you talked about you guys would move into these areas after the Japanese were pretty much pushed out, but it doesn't sound like they were always, always pushed out. Uh, did you ever get into battle with the Japanese or uh, snipers? Or, well, or... That, was, that was our big worry, snipers. They would hide up in those trees. And I don't know what it was with those Japanese. If they had any fear, they didn't show it. It was incredible how they would put one guy up in a tree and usually he didn't come out until somebody shot him out, you know. Their view of life is a lot different than ours, <laughs> I'll tell you. We kind of admired him in some ways, but we kind of wish they wouldn't that way, you know, because... Yeah. Uh, well, it must have been hard to live when you were always kind of constantly, you couldn't let your guard down, I wouldn't think. You were constantly... Yeah, you were, you were tense. Yeah. You were tense. That's what... Well, something else that goes along with this I just hated to get with a guy that couldn't control his fear. That was the main thing. Sure, it's all right to be afraid. If you got in a foxhole with some old boy that, I'm getting out of here, I'm getting out of here. You don't get out of here. Well, I never did knock one of them out, but I come close to it. And every once in a while, at night, well, we'd put our foxholes fairly close together, you know, so we could give the Japs a chance to crawl between them without some of us hearing it, you know. 
And uh, if you happen to get in a hole with a guy who couldn't control his fear, and they wanted to run. I never could figure that out. Because if you stick your head out of that foxhole, you're dead. You know, if you tried to get out and run away, why they had you, that's all there was to it. And you'd hear it start, you'd hear these guys whimpering, you know, and you'd hear somebody yeah, swearing like heck, shut up! And if they didn't shut up, you'd hear thunk. Everything got real quiet. Mm. Rifle butt right there will shut them up real quick. I felt sorry for them, but I wasn't about to let one of those stinkers give you guys away. That would yeah. give you. He might have a sore head, but he was still alive. Yeah, yeah. And yeah, you know. That that fear does funny things to people. It either makes you or breaks you, you know. Uh, yeah, I, I felt sorry for him, but I didn't feel sorry enough for him that I was going to let him get me shot. Yeah, know. right. And why? Well, like I say, fear does funny things to people, you know. If you can't control fear, you're in a bad, bad way. That's all there is to it, you know. And when I look back on all of that, you know, and like I say, I haven't been afraid of anything since, you know. Mm. And I have done things that uh, you couldn't believe some of the things I've done, you know. And it was all because I, I never was afraid of failing. That was something that I looked at after I got out and got back into a civilian job. I found out that I wasn't afraid of failing. Hmm. What the heck? Yeah, and that's a feeling you didn't have before you had joined the army. Mm -hmm. I'll be darned. Mm -hmm. hmm. Well, I found out I could go through some pretty rough situations still function and I found out I could control that old head Wow. Hmm. if you can't control what you're thinking you can get yourself in an awful lot of problems even in combat or out of combat and I think you'll agree with that you know yeah. that's what most people have to fight I think is fear. Uh, well, listen to TV. It's all based on fear, you know. And uh, if you can't control your fear, you're going to have a rough life. That's all there is to it. Yeah. You know. Could you describe to us, uh, particularly myself and others that will watch this, that have never been in combat, what it's like, what, what you, what's going through your mind, uh, or, and talk a little bit about some of the fighting you, you, you were involved in. You don't have time to think. <laughs> That's where you find out how well you can control mm. your own mind. If you can do what has to be done, you'll make it. If you let fear get the best of you, you ain't going to make it. And I was really proud of most of the guys. I'm telling you, you can say what you want to about the old American GI. They, they may not be the most genteel rascals in the world, but I'll tell you, the average GI I trusted him with my life. They were just that reliable, you know. But boy, those that couldn't control their fears, I didn't even want to be 
in gunshot of them. It was kind of pitiful. Those guys were miserable, Brad. I couldn't believe that they would suffer like that and not realize what was causing it. And like I say, I, I felt sorry for him, but I was kind of disgusted at him too. To see a grown man sit there and blubber and not do anything about it and try to get himself and you both killed was beyond my comprehension. <laughs> huh. It was beyond a lot of guys' comprehension because like I got told you, you know, you'd hear these guys whimpering and guys tell me, shut up, you know, and if he didn't shut up, thump. Yeah. Quiet. <laughs> uh, wow. But we made it. Yeah. You know, there's another strange thing. We lost more men after we went back up into India after the end of the war than we did while we were fighting. Is that right? What uh, what's the what was the cause of that? Muslims. Really? Yeah. Can you believe that? We got to where we wouldn't leave camp unless there was a truckload of us. Those stinking Muslims were crazy. And most of them were young. Nuttier than fruitcakes. You never knew what they were going to do. Yeah, they killed three of our guys. Hmm. And we were very fortunate. We never had a, a, a single fatality. We had certain guys got wounded, but we never had a, a fatality in Burma. Or go back to India and get three guys killed. <laughs> I'll be darned. Uh. That is hard for me to rationalize Obama's stance yeah. towards yeah. The Muslims. Right. Uh, yeah, it's sad that those guys made it all the way through all that fighting to die senseless like that, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Huh. Yeah. Do you, do you remember where you were when you heard about VJ Day? Was there, uh, I mean, how did how did news get to you guys? You were so isolated. Did you, did you get news from the outside as far as how yeah, the war was we going? Had, we or had radio. Oh, did you? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, heavens, yeah. We, we had radios that we could get. We didn't get clear around the world, you know. The FM radio was just coming in then, you know. And if you happened to get in the right place, you could, you could get, well, we could get back to the United States. Oh, is that right? Oh, okay. Yeah, it just depended on atmospheric yeah. conditions, you know. And, uh, well, Oh, it was incredible. You know, the radios developed like crazy during the war. And they were always coming out with one just a little bit better, you know. So the, as far as getting information, we never had that much trouble. Mm, okay. And, uh, yeah, we, we knew when uh, VJ, that was when the... Germans, the Japanese, when the war was finally over there, the VJ. Well, you probably heard, uh, were you in, in India when, when the war in Europe was finished? Or Yeah. Okay, uh -huh. so you caught all of that. So it, it, you, uh, when Roosevelt died and, and oh, you know, yeah. Germany surrendered and then Japanese surrendered, so. Yeah. Yeah, oh yeah, we, we heard all about that fairly quickly. Well, you know, we had all these radios mm -hmm. for that radar outfit, you know. And we usually had one powerful one to where we could talk back up into India, you know. Yeah, well, one night we were talking to the Philippines for crying out loud. Is that right? Yeah, it's clear across yeah. China, you yeah. know. It was just some atmospheric condition, you know. And, uh, yeah, it was kind of interesting. We had quite a conversation, those old boys, and they were all kind of surprised to hear from us, you know, and, huh. and it was really interesting and it was comical at the same time, yeah, you know. Yeah, that was yeah. something else. 
a bunch of GIs, well, you form attachments to those guys that you never form anywhere else you know. It was really interesting. Mm -hmm. They were, they were like brothers, you know. I would trust those guys and they would trust me, yeah, you know. Yeah. And that's something that you hardly ever develop to that degree in civilian life. Because, well, it boils down to the fact that you're protecting each other, right, you know. Right. And I mean really protecting each other, yeah. you know. And it's, it's a different mindset, different mentality altogether that you develop with those guys. It's one of those things, I wouldn't want to do it again, but I've been glad I had the experience. Yeah, yeah. Now through the years, have, have you kept in touch with any of these buddies or was there any sort of reunions uh, through the years after you got back? Yeah, there was, but they're all dead now. Yeah. I don't know, I, I wouldn't know where a single one of them are mm -hmm. now, you know, but I think most of them are dead. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, that's something else that was kind of tragic. You know, I told you I went back to Dodge City mm -hmm. and the first thing my wife said to me is, I don't want to be married. Why well, that happened time and time yeah, again. Yeah, right, right. I finally went to California to see one of my old buddies. He was going through the same thing. Mm. He told me after I was there two or three days, well, he finally broke down. And I told him my marriage had busted up. He says, well, yeah, don't feel stuck up. He says, mine is too. He says, I probably won't be married in another month. And he wasn't bitter about it. Hmm. He kind of had the same attitude I'd had towards it, you know. He was a Brazilian for crying out loud. And he finally got his citizenship papers after the war. Hmm. But he was a native of Brazil and he got drafted well, he let himself get drafted here, you know, and he went all through the war and did the same thing all of us old GIs did, you know. Yeah. And he wasn't even a citizen. I'll be darned. Yeah. Uh, hmm. But he was a boy, I liked that guy. He was smart. Uh. But his attitude towards his situation with his marriage was, it was kind of like mine. Yeah. I just got through fighting those chaps. I'm not going to come home and fight anymore. Fair enough. Yeah, yeah. You know, I forgot to ask you, now were you in the, the regular army or were you in the Army Air Corps or what, and what was your unit? Can you tell us uh, uh, you, uh, what army you were with and, and your unit number and all that? Well, we were kind of an oddball outfit. We were called the 559th Signal Air Warning Detachment. We weren't a battalion, we weren't a company, we were a detachment. Hmm. And uh, we were attached to the 10th Air Force that was based in India. Mm -hmm. And, well, like I say, we were kind of orphans. <laughs> okay. A detachment is a special organization. And, you know, being a radar outfit was pretty special. Yeah, yeah. Especially in that day and age, you know. Yeah, right, yeah. yeah. And so, uh, Yeah, well, actually, we were part of the Signal Corps. But 
but even though we were part of the Signal Corps, we still operated like we were part of the Air Force. <laughs> hmm. Like I say, a, a detachment was a yeah. The right. organization setup was different than than most organizations. It sounds and, egotistical, yeah. but uh, I am proud of my generation. Oh, absolutely. Yes. This is license. Absolutely, you have every right to be proud. Well, you know, it's interesting, you look back at history for the last 150 years, my parents saw the industrial age gear up and more or less the fruition of it in World War II. Mm -hmm. My generation is seeing the information age or the technical age yeah. and I don't know when the fruition of that thing is going to yeah. come to pass but uh, I've been looking back I don't know which one I admire the most is that right because Well, you know, when I look back, Brad, when we got out of the Army, you couldn't buy hardly anything, you know. Cars, what the heck, you know. And then a year's time, you could buy about anything you wanted. That was an interesting situation. And I think the thing that brought a lot of it about was this old GIs came home and we had seen what the United States could do. We could produce. It was a lot easier to transfer to civilian production than it was military production because we had all this infrastructure that they created to build war material. Right. To change that over to civilian wasn't much of a chore. And you know, and yeah, in a year, two years, you could buy about anything you wanted, you know. Huh. And it was incredible, the stuff that they shipped out of this country during World War II. And us old GIs, we knew we could do it. And I am kind of disappointed that our so-called baby boomers. Well, the ones I am disappointed in, Brad, is the ones that were born in their first 10 years. That group are ruthless, and I can't figure out why. Mm. They were the ones that rebelled against what we thought we were fighting yeah, for. right. He's getting away from his story. Yeah. Why did they do that? Yeah. Have you ever thought about no, that? No, no, uh no. -uh. I've thought about it a lot. I, uh, well, at first I thought, well, that's all guys came out of that war we came home and we all were able to get good jobs and we started giving our kids too much. I don't think that had a thing to do with it. There was a, a change of attitude and I, I can't quite figure out what caused it. Hmm. As they rebelled against all of the old traditional things, you know. Yeah. And I have just marveled at that because, like I said, I, oh, Brad, you can't imagine some of the things I've done. I've been in business for myself since 1976. Well, let's see. Yeah, let, let me wrap up uh, your war. I got a couple more questions about your war years. And then, yeah, let's talk about your post-year wars. 
One thing um, you had talked about when you were in the hospital on, on December 7th and your mom came in and cried uh, that she was worried about you. After you got back, did she ever talk about what she was going through with you overseas? And uh, Oh, yeah, she was. Well, I had two brothers, and we all made it through. So all three of you served. So she was worried about three different. And she, oh, she just hugged us and said, so thankful for the good Lord for bringing you all home. Yeah. Yeah, it was, it was rough on mothers. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's always rougher on mothers than it is fathers. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But she was so thankful to see us all show up again, and none of us had got wounded seriously or wow, wow. injured or anything, you wow. know. And well, my youngest brother, he was in lady. Well, first of all, he was in. The, New Guinea. He was island hopping over there, you know. Oh. And he was in on uh, the invasion of the Philippines. A lady. And how he ever made it through that, I'll never know. But he, it affected him like it has me, I think because that guy has done some of the most fantastic things you'd ever think about. He was in business for himself. He's, he passed away here. Well, just last year. Yeah. Yeah, just last year. He uh, ended up with a business where he was plowing telephone cable for uh, Midwest Bell Telephone. He had a whole bunch of caterpillars and cable plows and oh, trucks. You can't imagine all the stuff he had. And he worked in Kansas, Nebraska, Iowa, Minnesota, Dakotas, huh. all over the yeah. place, you know, plowing telephone cable. Huh. And, of course, that's all changed now, yeah. you know. Yeah. yeah. All going through the atmosphere now. Yeah, yeah. But uh, uh, well, amongst other things, he, he farmed for a while. And then he uh, bought a laundry. And that didn't last very long, because I was too confined. <laughs> And uh, then he uh, bought a uh, scraper and a caterpillar and went out for an outfit building dikes along the Missouri River. And I don't know how, well, I think that uh, this cable plowing was kind of a fallout from that, you know. He found out that he could do it, and he had had this big old catch, you know, and he he liked it. That was the other thing, you know. He liked it. That's <laughs> that's something else. If you want to enjoy life, you can't let yourself get pinned down to something you don't like to do. I just get so. Sorry for guys. They hate what they're doing, but they will be miserable in familiar circumstances rather than taking a chance on mm. doing something that they would like. Mm. I've never been able to quite understand that mindset because, uh, well, yeah. What? Well, how was it? How was it for you, as far as after everything you had seen and experienced and been through? How was that transition for you going from military life to uh, civilian life again? Was that much of a change for you? And and we know today that there's this uh, 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 post 
dramatic uh, stress. Did, do you think you went through any of that, or was it uh, was it a pretty easy transition for you? No, I, I didn't. As a matter of fact, very few World War II guys went through anything like that that I know of. But it was neat for you yourself. It, you had no problems adjusting back to, to, to life, civilian life again. Yeah. yeah. Hmm. Okay. I, uh, yeah, that's what has blown me away so much with this first crop of baby boomers is that attitude that they came out with. Uh, I don't know. Yeah, okay. Okay. Well, let's go. Let's now. Let's talk about your post-war years and talk a little bit about your careers and your family, and and we'll, we'll then we'll wrap down, wrap up this uh, this interview. Okay. So talk about a little bit about what you did, went on to do after the war, and oh, a little bit well, about your family and. It's like I say. It's a very unique experience, and uh, it sort of disorients you for a while, or it did me, you know. Because when I first got out, uh, I didn't want to work. I just wanted to goof off, not do anything. And that's what I did. And I got that out of my system. And uh, well, f first job I had was working for my ex-father-in-law, he had a grocery store, and he gave me a job there while he, he, he kept saying that uh, he had, that I and his daughter would work things out, well I knew we weren't going to because I just, well I was, wasn't going to do it. Yeah, really. yeah. And uh, I worked there for a little while, and I, oh, I hated that with a purple passion, you know. And uh, then I went to work with Fairmont Creameries, washing milk bottles, <laughs> and ended up running the ice cream machines. Oh. Man, you can sure make some good ice cream when you got the stuff to do it with. <laughs> I used to make up special batches every once in a while, and I'd take it around and give it to all the employees, you know, <laughs> and make it extra rich and extra flavorful. You know? <laughs> and uh, that job, no, uh, it was just a podunk job, you know. But the people were nice, and I, I did kind of enjoy it, you know. But it was something that I soon found out I didn't want to make a career out of something like that yeah. because I mean, any idiot can shag milk bottles around, you know. And uh, I got a chance to go to work on a fire department at the Dodge City Air Base. So I went out there. And in about two weeks, I was climbing the walls. I couldn't stand it. And I <clears throat> got a chance to drive a truck, so I took that. And I drove a truck for about a year. And, uh, oh, I kind of enjoyed that, but it wasn't very challenging, you know. And I had got acquainted with some guys that worked in the oil field, there's roughnecks on drilling rigs, you know, and uh, well, I found out there was a drilling rig. Well, I, I had a sister that, and her husband, they lived on a farm over in eastern Kansas with a little place called Bushon, Kansas. And I'd gone to visit them, and I heard about this drilling rig that was about 30 miles west of where they lived. And uh, these oil field guys that I got acquainted with, I asked them, well, how do you get on the oil field? And they said, well, just go out to the rigs. They'll hire you. 
And so I drove out to that rig, and sure enough, that guy hired me. It's a roughneck. <laughs> and I'd never roughnecked my life, you know. I didn't know what it was, but I worked there about 10 days. One of his roughnecks had got hurt, and I was just filling in for this guy that got hurt. And I found out that, oh man, I just loved it, you know. Huh. And there was a boom going on at that particular time. This was in 1947. And uh, around, around Plainville and Hayes and... Mm -hmm. Russell. Russell. There was a boom going on. I mean, there was rigs sticking up like dog hair all over that place, you know. And this old driller that I was roughnecking for back there in eastern Kansas, he told me, he said, well, go out there. He said, they'll put you to work. So I cranked up my old car and I drove out there to Plainville, Kansas. And I checked in the only hotel in town. <laughs> and I was sitting out in front. This was about 5 o'clock in the evening. And a guy drove up and got out of his car and came over and sat down in a chair. We started talking, and uh, while we were talking, why uh, another guy walked up and he went over and started talking to this guy that I had been visiting with, and I just kind of backed off, didn't even listen to what they were talking about, and pretty soon this guy had been talking to, he hollered over at me. And, he said, are you a tool dresser? I said, I don't know. What, what's a tool dresser? He <laughs> said, well, biggest qualification is weak mind and strong back. <laughs> I said, I'm a tool dresser. He said, you want to go to work in the morning? I said, what? He said, do you want to go to work in the morning? He said, I own a drilling rig. I said, well, sure, that's what I come out here for. And uh, this guy that had walked up to talk to him was an old cable tool driller. This was on a cable tool rig. It wasn't a rotary rig. And uh, he said, this guy's a driller. He said, he's going to go out drilling on my rig in the morning. But he said, he doesn't have a car. And he said, I don't know if I had a car. And I said, oh, yeah, i got a car. And he said, will you haul him to work? And I said, yeah. So. I go to work the next morning as a tool dresser on a cable tool rig, you know. And I'm telling you, that was an experience. The cable tools are the first drilling rigs that go way back. The first oil wells that they ever drilled was drilled with cable tools, you know. You know what cable tools uh, are? Explain to us yeah, what uh, that is. Explain to that what that is. Well, cable tools they stomp a hole in the ground is what they do. You've got a great big long drill stem that's just solid iron about four inches in diameter and about 30 feet long and you put a bit on the end of that thing and you've got a like a teeter-totter a beam up there that pulls that weight up and down on the end of your cable and every time it hits the ground it chips out some rock, you know, and you just more or less stomp a hole in the ground. Huh. And uh, there's two men make a crew on a cable tool rig, a driller and a tool dresser. And uh, I did that, uh, I don't remember how long I'd been doing that, and uh, I went into a cafe there one evening in Plainville, and here, this old driller I'd been roughnecking for in eastern Kansas was sitting in there. And I said, well, what in the world are you doing? He said, oh, I've come out here. He said, we're bringing a rig out here. And he'd been in the oil field his whole life. And uh, he said, uh, he want to know what I was doing. I said, I'm dressing tools. He said, quit. I need a tool dresser. He said, we're bringing tool dresser, bringing cable tools out here. I said, good, I quit right now. And next morning I went out and I told the driller this was going to be my last day and 
I went to work for this old driller that I'd been roughnecking for over there in eastern Kansas, and we took this old cable tool out and rigged it up down south of uh, Cleanville there. No, south of Hayes. But anyway, we drilled a, well, they used cable tools to, to what they called tailing a well in. They would drill it down to the formations with a rotary and then they'd come in with these cable tools and with the cable tools you could drill that much if you needed to, you know. Well, with a rotary, you, it's difficult to drill that much and not overdo it, you mm -hmm. know, because they wanted to just drill just so much, you know, and go into those formations just a certain amount to get maximum production. And uh, that's what we were doing. We were tailing in wells after the rotary rig got through with them, you know. And we tailed in two or three wells, and uh, this guy's name was Joe, Joe Heffern. He turned out to be one of my best friends. I knew that guy the rest of my life. Uh -huh. But anyway, uh, we went out to rig one morning, and he said, this is going to be our last day on this rig. He said that he told me who it was, some outfit that he knew. He said, they're bringing a a rotary and I'm going to go back drilling on a rotary rig. He said, you want to go roughnecking for me? And I said, you bet your life. And so we went over on that rotary rig and, uh, well, I spent 10 years. Is that right? In uh, the oil field. Uh. Well, that was in 1940. That was 1948 when I met this driller again and went out roughnecking for him. That was in the first port of 48. And then, uh, like I say, I, we became fast friends and we stayed together for years. We just liked each other. And uh, wherever, his name was Joe Heffron. And wherever Joe went, well, that's where I went. And uh, In 1950, an outfit called El Capitan Oil Company bought a brand new drilling rig, hauled it into Great Bend, Kansas, and we went down there and we rigged that thing up, made a drilling rig out of it. And we loaded that thing up and hauled it up to Glen Rock, Wyoming and drilled three wells up there with it loaded it up and hauled it out in the middle of Utah and drilled three wells with it there and I met her. Okay. <laughs> that was in 1950. And yeah, that was the, well, we were married October the 5th, 1950. And we finally came back to Kansas after we got married. And uh, of course, I went back out in the oil field again. And the first part of 1951, they made a driller out of me. You know, I don't know whether you're familiar with the setup of a rig. Well, on a rotary, you got a tool pusher that's the boss of the rig, and the tool pusher hires three drillers, and the driller hires four roughnecks. So uh, they made me a driller. I went out and hired me four roughnecks and went out. And uh, yeah, I run a drilling rig then for about 10 years. Hmm. And oh man, I loved it. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. But in 1940, 19. Nineteen fifty-seven or nineteen fifty-eight or fifty-nine, somewhere along in there, the oil field started taking a slump. And in the meantime, I'd got acquainted with some iron workers, 
And it just happened, I was working on a drilling rig out by Worland, Wyoming, and a bunch of iron workers came in there to build a compression plant, and I got acquainted with some of them, and I found out that those doggone iron workers are making $3.25 an hour. Well, I was only making $2.85 an hour, but, you know, we worked seven days a week in the oil fields, and made a good check, but if I could work 40 hours for three dollars and a quarter, that's a pretty good deal. So I went over to Casper, Wyoming, and talked to the union over there and told them I'd like to join the iron workers. He said, okay, fine. So he said, I'll get in touch with you. So I went back out to Worland and went back to work on this drilling rig. And in about a week, I get a call from this business agent from Casper. He said, uh, you ready to go iron working? And I said, you bet your life. And he said, okay, I got a job right there at Worland on that compression plant. And I said, well, how lucky can you get? And he said, I'm sending a, another guy out on that job and I'll send a work order along with him. You go out there with him and check in and and start working iron. Well, I went out there on that job, and I, it took three months to finish the job. The job was about half finished when I went to work out there. And uh, at the end of three months, I went over to Casper to take the test to be a iron worker, and uh, they have uh, different books, they call them. You can be a rodman, you can be a welder, you can be a rigger, you can be a journeyman. If you're a journeyman, you can do everything, you know. So I walked over there to the business office at, for the iron workers and I told them I wanted to take the test to be a journeyman iron worker. He said, well, you only work three months. Well, Iron work, I mean, uh, oil field was an awful lot like iron working, you know. That's all, that's all you do is handle iron, you know. Mm -hmm. The oil field not, might not be the best of anything, but it was always the biggest, you know. 24-inch <laughs> pipe wrench was a little pipe wrench in the oil fields, you know. I said, no, I want to take test for a journeyman iron worker. So they said, okay. Your funeral. And I sat down and I only missed two questions. And they couldn't believe it. And I said, well, doggone it, running a drilling rig is an awful lot like working iron, so don't be surprised. And you know, that impressed those guys so much that I never did have any trouble getting a job after that. Huh. And I did that for. Uh, I can't get my memory straight here. I think I worked iron just as a journeyman iron worker till about nineteen. 67. So roughly another 10 years or so then in the... And uh, I was working for an outfit over here in Greeley, Colorado. And uh, his superintendent got sick. And he had me hired as a iron worker foreman. And when his foreman or his superintendent got sick, he came to me and he said, Will you run this outfit for me? And I said, well, at that time, if you were a superintendent, the iron workers looked at you as a company man and you had to drop out of the iron workers, you know. And I explained the situation to him and he said, well, there ought to be some way to get around it, you know. And I'd talked to the, some of the guys and they said, well, just have him hire you as Iron worker, general foreman, and 
it'll satisfy the union and you can still be superintendent. So that's what it did. And uh, then about 1970, he got fed up with the union and he dropped out of the union. He wasn't union anymore and he asked me if I would stay with him. And I thought it over, you know, and he said, well, sit down and do some figuring. What you think you'd have to have, because he said, I know you're going to get raises and you got your benefits and everything with the iron workers. <clears throat> so I sat down and did some figuring, and at that time, iron workers were making about $7 an hour. And... Uh, I tried to take everything into consideration and I tried to figure all of the potentials, you know. And I went back to him and I said, well, how about expenses, a truck, and $10 an hour? He said, sold. And so I took the company over for him and well, I was his superintendent up to 1976. And I don't know what in the world ever happened to that guy. He was the nicest guy you ever want to meet in the world, ever want to meet, you know. But he got crossways with the IRS. Mm -hmm. And they shut him down. Well, we had done work for, oh my goodness, all over the country, you know. And we did a lot of work for Farmland Industries which is a parent company of all of the farmers co-ops around and over the country, you know. And I got acquainted with some of their wheels. And uh, it just so happened that uh, Joe didn't have anything going on and I wasn't doing anything and he wasn't doing anything either. And I got a call from the supervisor of this area from Farmland Industries back in Kansas City. And he said, we got a job up in Chugwater, Wyoming. And he told me what it was. And I said, okay, I'll go get Joe and we go look at it. He said, no, I don't want Joe. I want you to go look at it. I thought about it for about two seconds and I said, okay. <laughs> so I went up there and looked the job over and I told him what I'd do it for. He said, get busy. And I've been doing it ever since. I'll be done. We ship well, doors to Alaska. I, we when I first went into down the business for myself. So you went into business for yourself in 76 then, pretty much, from yeah. that point on? Mm -hmm. Well, I did, first, when I first started out and, uh, for myself, I uh, was doing a lot of millwright work. You know what millwright is? Green elevators mm -hmm. and green storage and stuff like that. And I wasn't real fond of that. And I got a call from a outfit from, what was it, Golden, Colorado. And he wanted to talk to me. He built airplane hangar doors. And he had a job up in uh, Aspen. And he said, I need somebody to go up there and finish that job. And he says, they tell me you're pretty good. And I said, well, I hope so. And he said, well, will you go look at that job? So I went up there and I looked at it. Well, it had two great big old airplane hangar doors that they were putting on a hangar up there, you know. And the people he had up there, I'm telling you, they couldn't pour sand out of a boot. I don't know how in the world he got such lousy hands but I looked the thing over and I said, well, I don't see any problems here. What, what's the problem? He said, well, we're not getting anything done. And I said, well, I've got men 
He said, well, will you go see if you can finish that job? Oh, I said, yeah. And I just signed a labor contract with him. And I gathered up my hands and went up there and we finished that job. Just no problem at all, you know. Well, in the meantime, he had another job over in Eagle, a 70-foot wide bifold aircraft hangar door, you know. And I went over there and I built that door right on the site, picked it up and installed it and everything. But in the meantime, he had paid me for doing that work over in Aspen. And when I finished that job in uh, Eagle, well, he had another job down in Pueblo, and I went down there on that. But he gave me a check for the job in Eagle, and that thing bounced higher than a kite. Oh, boy. Well, I didn't think too much about it, you know, because after everybody has a check bounce once in a while, you know. But he never was able to get that check straightened out, you know. And he'd set up a shop down south of Denver, and he had an old boy stationed in there that was building doors. And uh, he hadn't got paid either. And we kind of got our heads together, and we found out his name was uh, Wally Schreiber. You should have seen that guy. He ran around in overalls. He looked like a farmer, and you'd trusted him with your last dime. Yeah. He had a job up in Casper with seven doors. He had a job over in Colby, Kansas with 12 doors. He had a job down here in Longmont with seven doors. He had a job out in Craig, Colorado with 10 doors. And uh, none of them were getting done. And I just happened to be in his shop one day, and the phone rang. Well, is this contractor in Casper wanting to know where his doors were? And I said, well, let's back up a little bit here. I said, I don't know you, and I know you don't know me. I told him who I was and that I'd been uh, building or installing doors for this Wally Schreiber. And uh, I said, he hasn't got me paid. And I said, he's got doors laying here that are supposed to go up to your job, I know. But I said, we've thrown a lien on them until I get paid, until his fabricator gets paid. Those doors aren't leaving here. And he said, well, let me give you a proposition. He said, if I pay you, will you bring those doors up here? I thought about that for about three seconds. I said, yeah, I'll be up tomorrow with three doors. <laughs> so, uh, and this old boy had a big long trailer that uh, put three doors on it, hauled them up to Casper, and that contractor up there, Trees Word, well, he, he paid us to bring the doors up. And, uh, he asked me, he said, well, he said, I don't need anybody to put these up. He said, will you stay here and put these doors up? And he said, now, I want to tell you something. He said, that Wally has milked this job till there's hardly any money left in this job. And I said, well, I can't do anything about that. I hope you don't blame me for it. He said, no, I just want you to be aware of the situation. He said, I would just like for you to take this job on a labor contract. I said, okay, I can do that. So uh, I took my men up there, and we installed those seven doors. Well, these people on these other jobs, they were comparing notes, you know. And when I finished that job in Casper, well, this guy in Colby, he'd already called me, and he had it rigged up that I'd come over and install his doors. And uh, it so happened that this guy that was fabricating doors for him, he had signed a contract with that guy in Colby. Well, he'd signed contracts with all these guys to put their doors up, and he couldn't do it for some reason or other. And I 
told him, I said, well, this fabricator's got a contract with you. I said, how are we going to get around that? And he said, I'm a lawyer. Don't worry about it. <laughs> he canceled the contract. And I went over there and put his doors up. In the meantime, these other two guys were watching me, you know. And when I got that job finished, well, these guys down in Longmont asked me if I'd come over there and finish theirs. Went over there and finished them. And in the meantime, this guy out in Craig got a hold of me and wanted to know if I'd come and finish his doors. So I was in the door business, whether I wanted to be or not. <laughs> and that was 30 years ago. I'll be darned. Uh, uh, how long ago then did you uh, then did you retire? Finally, two years ago. Two years ago is that right? Uh, I'll be darned. Hmm. Well, let's talk a little bit about your family. Yeah, uh, you married Lola. It, 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 so last October would have been your sixtieth uh, mm -hmm. anniversary. Uh, well, like I'm and, telling you, I went out to Utah that drilling rig and. One of her brother-in-laws went to work as a roughneck on that drilling rig. And this was out in what they call Milford Valley. I don't know whether you're familiar with Utah or not, but it's just about right slap in the middle of Utah. And Milford Valley is a great big valley that, oh my goodness, how long and how wide I, is that thing? I don't know. It must be a hundred miles long and fifty miles wide, and got the biggest sagebrush you ever saw in your life. Huh. You know. And you don't draw it out too long. Yeah. Huh? Don't draw it out too long. Your story. <laughs> hmm. Where was I? <laughs> so you met you met Lola through her her brother uh, out at the rig. Well, yeah. Dan had come down there to go to work on the rig and. It was right up next to the 4th of July. Well, we were, us old oil field hands were all living in uh, Beaver. Beaver is a town about 60 miles south of Fillmore where her family lived. And uh, the 4th of July, they always had a big dance and celebration there in Beaver. Well, it so happened that uh, they all knew about it, you know. And so her brother-in-law and his wife or her sister said they were going to come down and go to the dance with us, you know. Well, they did. And when they showed up, why, Lola and one of her friends were with them, you know. And I drank in that day and age, and I'd been drinking a little bit. And when I met Lola, I was embarrassed to pieces. And, uh, well, I met her. Why it, were you embarrassed? Because I was about half shot. Mm. Well, I, I knew she didn't drink, you know. But anyway, I lost my train of thought again here. Well, anyway, uh, they introduced me to her there in the cafe, and we all ended up out at this dance floor they had set up out on the east side of uh, Beaver. And uh, I was just moping around out there, and wasn't doing much of anything. And lo and behold, Lola walked up next to me. And we were just standing there talking, and another one of the oil field guys came up and joined in the conversation and uh, another guy walked up and he asked Lola to dance and Lola didn't want to dance with him I guess but anyway she said well I got to dance with this guy and she pointed at me you know and I thought she was just using that as an excuse not to dance with this other guy you know I was because <laughs> he'd been drinking too and he was my dad would have killed me. <laughs> I've never drunk in my life. But anyway, that's how it all started. That's how it started. And so 60 years later, any uh, children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren? 
We've got five grandchildren. We have three children. Mm -hmm. And our daughter is the only one that has given us any grandchildren. And they're in New Jersey. Very good. Our oldest granddaughter, she was born in Kobe, Japan. Her father was flying for Al Nippon Airlines. So Mac and I, well, I was in Japan five weeks, and then Mac came over for a week. And that was quite an experience. Yeah, I'll bet. I'll oh, bet. it was wonderful. Yeah. Japanese are very, very clean people. Yeah. Very clean. But anyway, uh, the other four children, they were born in Longmont. And then they moved all the way to New Jersey. Mm. So we don't have any great grandchildren. Yeah. Okay. okay. Well, Mac, we'll start to uh, wind down this interview. Uh, is there anything I didn't ask? And Lola, jump in as you've listened to this too. Is there anything I didn't ask you wanted to talk about, or any stories that you've thought about as we've been talking that you'd like to to talk about? So hopefully, we rounded out your story as best we could. Or, or do you think we ca captured your story pretty good? Well, that pretty well covers thing. Well, this is the outcome of my military experience. Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah. Nearly got my head blown off over there, and it ruined my hearing. Yeah, they were being shelled in a foxhole. As it turned out, it was, you know, our own men. Friendly fire, huh? Uh-huh, friendly What's that? fire. Yeah, it was a friendly fire? We, yeah. Oh, boy. Yeah, uh, we were, well, there were three of us. This, things were, had wound down pretty much, and we hadn't seen any Japs for quite a while, and our company commander asked three of us to take a little walk in the woods, you know, and there's three of us, all of us sergeants. All three of us are buck sergeant. And we took off and prowled around and we came to the Irwadi River. The Irwadi River is a principal river that runs down through central Burma. And that is a huge river. And we were standing there trying to decide whether we wanted to cross that river and look on the other side. And we were sticking our hands in the water and that was pretty close to the mountains. And that water had just come down out of the mountains and boy, it was ice cold. And we decided that was too darn cold to be trying because we didn't know how deep it was. And uh, while we were standing there discussing this, kablooey! Stuff started falling down on us, you know, and boy, we took off running. We thought an artillery shell had landed up above us, you know, and we took off running. When we finally slowed down, why none of us could hear, you know, and uh, well, we we figured out that there was a gun emplacement right up above oh, where, wow. where we were standing and the barrel that well like we were here and the barrel that gun was right here you know but it was about 30 feet above us and when that thing went off we got the full benefit of that blast you know of that muzzle blast and it deafened all of us we none of us could hear a thing there for about three days and we finally made our way back to camp, and well, we could still hardly hear. We made the CO understand what had happened, you know, and uh, we didn't go to a medic or anything because we was a thousand miles from anywhere, you know, down there in the middle of Burma, and. Uh, Next day, we got up, uh, we was all checking each other to see how things were going, and we were 
improving a little bit, you know, our ears were still ringing quite a bit, you know, but about three days where we kind of got big share of her hearing back. But down through the years, well, going to work in the oil field didn't help things a bit, you know, because that's one of the noisiest jobs you can yeah. get. And as a consequence, I, I pretty well lost my hearing. Hmm. Hmm. Hopefully the VA's helped you out, though, with that. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. Mm -hmm. I thought they were in a fox, so I'm yeah. sorry. Yeah. Well, one last question, Mac, uh, that I always like to ask to end these interviews, and, and you kind of talked about it a little bit as we were talking here, but how do you think your war experience affected your life, changed your life, uh, played a role in your life, or did it? Or was it just simply a chapter in your life you went through? How do you think you would answer that? What was that again, Neil? Uh, your war experience, how do you think that affected your life or changed your life or played a role in your life? Or was it just simply just a chapter of your life that you went through? It gave me confidence I didn't know I had. Like I said, I've never been afraid of anything yeah. since then. And I didn't know I had that capability. And as a consequence, I've done a lot of things, and this is what I've told you. Just yeah, right, sure, yeah, okay, yeah. And uh, again, even though it was a overall a positive experience, I wouldn't want to do it again. <laughs> Fair enough, yeah. Fair and enough. I think it affects a lot of guys like that, yeah. you know, because you know, when you when you go into combat, your biggest worry is, am I going to chicken out? And I would say 95% of the guys go through that, you know. And if you make it, it, it does something to you. Yeah. And the big share of the guys made it, you know. And that's why you develop those bonds that you never develop in civilian life, yeah. you know. Yeah. Yeah. Because you get to know the true man, and uh, there's hardly any experiences that I can think of in civilian life to compare to some of the experiences you go through in combat. Right, right. Both of our boys have served in the military. Our oldest son, he was in the Army, he was in ballistic missiles. And our next son, Roger, he was a Marine, and when he got out, he was a major, he was a fighter pilot, and he was training instructors. He was an instructor of instructors. Oh. And he's just coming in right now. Well, Mac, I want to thank you for uh, sitting down to tell your story today. But more importantly, I want to thank you for your service to our country. Mac, after we uh, uh, kind of shut down the camera, we got talking a little bit more about your experience in Burma and uh, wanted to ask you a little bit more about, you said you guys followed behind Merrill's Raiders. Uh, can you talk a little bit about... Marauders. Marauders, I'm sorry, Marauders. Can you talk, can you talk a little bit about... Uh, that experience after they came through and you followed behind them. Can you talk? Yeah, well, we weren't, we weren't part of them. Right, we right. We just were intermingled with right, them, you know, right. and associated with them just through our activities, you know. And uh, we did benefit greatly from their presence there, you know, because they kept the Japs off of us. And uh, like I say, they were some of the best soldiers I ever saw. And I admired them greatly. And General Merrill, like I say, he was a salty old son of a gun, but he knew what he was doing and he knew what he wanted to do. I mean, he was, he was just part of what made America 
so victorious in yeah. World War II, I think. Because, uh, you know, we had a lot of outstanding generals. I've often <clears throat> thought about it. I mean, we had Chenault, Stilwell, and General Merrill right there in Burma, you know, yeah. which was kind of unusual to have three characters like that grouped that closely together. Because they, they were quite a bit the same kind of man, mindset, you know. They, they were rough and tough, but they were fair. And I think most of the guys would have followed them anywhere, you know, because yeah. they weren't rear echelon generals. They were right up there with you, you know. Yeah. Well, now, if, if you were mingled with Merrill's men, you were right in the thick of the action then, weren't you, pretty much? Or, yeah, off and on. It, it yeah. varied like the crazy, you know. Yeah. And, yeah, it was... Uh, <laughs> uh, it, it had got to the point where the Japanese were getting desperate, you know. And... Uh, Well, towards the last, most of their activity was looking for something to eat. They weren't interested in shooting us GIs. They were interested in getting their food, you know. And uh, General Merrill's people just made that real rough for them to do, you know. And uh, the Japs just more or less starved themselves out of existence because they didn't have the uh, supply lines to yeah. help themselves, you know. It's, it's kind of mind-boggling to think that supposedly intelligent people can do such stupid things, you know. Yeah. Because we see that in all countries, but I've never been able to understand how these leaders will start some action like that and think they can win it. They, they must be blind. Yeah. yeah. Well, Mac, you said you associated with them. Was it in their fighting or...? Yeah, yeah, we, we weren't... Well, and their association was just casual. It wasn't, wasn't that we were part of them. We just... Well, run into them okay. periodically, you know. We were in the same areas, but we weren't together per se. Okay. And... Uh, there was a bunch of, a bunch of uh, Merrill's men on the ship on the return home? Yeah. Okay. And it just so happened that uh, our outfit and some of these marauders had to pull guard duty on the ship. Now, I don't know who was going to attack us, but we were coming home, the war was over, but we still had to stand guard duty, you know. Well, like I say, a lot of those guys had jungle rot in their feet, you know, and they just had their feet all bandaged up. And uh, I had a guard station on one side of the uh, galley at a, at a door, and over on the other side, there was another door in one of Merrill's marauders. He was a sergeant, staff sergeant. He had that station. Well, he just jumped up on the counter and was just sitting on this counter, you know. And they were, the Marines were in charge of the guards on that ship. And I and this uh, other guard were standing there doing her guard duty, you know, and uh, this lieutenant comes walking through. And, uh, of course, I saluted him, and he walked over to this uh, marauder, and he just sat there. And this lieutenant, he was a second lieutenant. It was his first assignment it was to take this troop ship over and pick up a load and bring him home, you know. Well, he jumped all over this sergeant. He said, Sergeant, get on your feet. You're supposed to salute. I'm an officer. 
surgeon said, my feet hurt. <laughs> the lieutenant said, did you sit down when you was on guard duty over in Burma? I sure did. <laughs> that lieutenant just about blew a gasket and he was going to report him. The sergeant said, you're welcome. I'm not standing up. My feet hurt. Well, that poor little old lieutenant, he went and complained to his, his commanding officer. And we heard through the grapevine that his commanding officer took him aside and gave him a little heart-to-heart -heart talk. <laughs> and his lieutenant, I know you mean well, but he said, these are combat veterans. They've seen things you don't even imagine. And if he's sitting down, I wouldn't worry about it. So just leave him alone. And we never saw that lieutenant again. I don't know what happened to him. <laughs> Mac, when you were in the jungle and you were dealing with the snipers, was it a buddy that had just taken his helmet off and oh. he was shot through the head? Our lieutenant, he stepped outside of a tent with a lighted lantern in his hand. And kablooey, a sniper hit his lantern. He was lucky the doggone lantern didn't blow up, you know. He hit the top of it, and of course it went out. But our company commander really read that lieutenant out, and that lieutenant became the biggest blackout advocate you ever saw in your life. <laughs> uh, wow. Why? He wanted to step out with that lighted lantern because he, we knew snipers were around. And at night, you just, well, you just showed everybody where you were. Yeah. You had a light like that, you know. And yeah, he just stepped outside of the tent and blew his lantern blew up. And, well, it caused the whole outfit to go on alert, you know. We all dropped in our foxholes and loaded up, ready for what we didn't know what. But it was that one shot, and that was it. Yeah. Was, that, wasn't there another man in your in your group that huh? was shot through the head with the, from a sniper? Well, he he just got a glancing. Oh, okay. He was a corporal. He got 